So we have, with this two very awesome people, Jason was our awesome host yesterday, and he's back again. So I'm going to welcome the stage shortly. Tony Chapman, Chatter That Matters. He put himself through University Summit Radio, his first entrepreneurial of Benner's community, a corporate communications firm that he founded in 79 with Andrew Wright. In their 12 years, they went on to win many gold awards and create stage events all over the world and be the creative force behind the Hockey Hall of Fame and the Pepsi Theater of Imagination in Ontario Place. His next venture, Capital C, is an agency that is renowned for big ideas. They won many marketing uh, magazine agency of the year award. In the past decade, he's hosted and spoken at conferences all over the world. His Chatter That Matter platform includes two one-hour radio shows across nine Bell Media radio stations and a podcast now ranked in the top 1% in the world. For more than 25 years, the world's smartest organizations have turned to Jason for his communication leadership, original mind, and Muppet-like energy to engage audiences, win business, accelerate careers, and communicate way more effectively. Whether it's writing a better presentation, coaching a pitch team, or inspiring the development of better content, Jason delivers the helpful process, landmark insights, and game-changing outputs that help you break through. Tony and Jason are going to have a conversation about stop telling your story, become a part of theirs. Let's welcome to the stage, Tony and Jason. Good morning, super friends. How are we feeling? Got the coffee going? Make sure you got lots of that happening. This is an exciting moment for me personally. When I was uh, 24 years old, so what, like three, four years ago, I, uh, I was at Ryerson and taking radio and television arts and every single week our writing professor, Dr. Bob Gardner, would take us on a field trip. And you know, we saw, we met with like the producers of The Simpsons and all sorts of stuff. And one week they took us to this like place. And I was trying to figure out what I was gonna do in my life. I'm in second year university. I know I wanna write in some way, shape or form. And I think maybe advertising, but advertising eats their children. So I'm like, I'm not so sure. And so we walk into this boardroom one day and the door closes and the whole room lights up with Rudyard Kipling's If. It's a multi-image show using projectors and that sort of stuff. And, and I get goosebumps and I think I found it. I found the moment and I found the place that I want to be. And it just so happens to be an agency you founded in 1979 called Communique that got me the start. So really, I want to start today by saying thanks for my career. Was there a commission on that? That's right. <laughs> Send me an invoice. Tony, you know, when it comes to marketing in this country, your name is synonymous. You are truly one of the thought leaders in the space. You're doing and have done so many incredible things. We just heard a bit of your bio about how you started in Montreal and in sales and that sort of stuff. Tell us a little bit about where that genesis begins. You know, you have the entrepreneurial mindset from the get-go. What does that look like as a kid and growing up? Yeah, so thank you for having me, and, and it, we're gonna open up some questions after, because I wanna make this really relevant for you, but to share that personal story, I just was, uh, I was looking back now very fortunate. At the time, it wasn't so fortunate. My dad was bipolar and, and self-medicated with alcohol, so our, our house was always, uh, we're one step away from disaster, but my mother, on the other hand, was this extraordinary woman. And one day I wanted to create a lemonade stand. And like every kid does, shake the neighbors down for some quarters. And she thought it was a good idea. Well, she turned that into a, uh, an MBA degree. I had to rent the pitcher, figure out the margin on the lemonade. Uh, I, had, I couldn't set it up my front lawn. I had to drag it down to the park where it was sunny. And at the end of the day, I, 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 you know, this parts of your life are fragments and other parts are vivid. That memory is so vivid, and I don't know if I made any more money, but it was my money. And that was the beginning of what I realized was a sense that if you put your effort into something you're passionate about, it's not so much the financial rewards, it's the intellectual and emotional. Intellectual is you're stimulated, you're learning, you're on an adventure, you're putting something new in your knapsack. And then the emotional rewards is it, it, you did it. It was yours. There was, and that's today with so many things happening in the cloud, we don't have that sense of outcome, you know, where I did that day. And I, I've always said to people that I've mentored along the life, if you have 
you're lucky enough in this industry, you should be lucky enough to find intellectual stimulation and an emotional reward, money will chase you or your career, whatever your dreams are, whatever you manifest will come to you as long as you keep both of those two, two things firing. When you get in a, stuck in a job you're getting tired of or you just feel like you're constantly being beaten up by you know, clients or some, whatever the situation and it wears you down, but when you elevate it to the surface, that to me is where I got my uh, start with and it's kind of carried me through life. I love that. I love that. Lemonade stand. I've got kids every summer ask the same thing. It's gotten a little better these days. You know, there's a, a couple of companies that actually make pre-made lemonade stands. So you know, when you're dragging it down, it actually makes it a little bit easier. But I like this idea of... That could be what's wrong with the world. No, the kids should be using cardboard and they making a lemonade agreed, stand. Agreed. Very agreed. Good. Imagination. Parent, I could see the parents buying the lemonade stand on Amazon, which I... By the way, I, I hate, I love retail, Canadian retail, but, and then setting it up for the kids and then texting them and saying, come on down, I've got all the lemonade set up and smile and then, you know, like, yeah. I, I had a different experience. That, I, I think that's very fair and it's good to have kids who are like demanding on, I bought lemons, let's figure it out. So I'm trying to do the hybrid thing, right? <laughs> All right, so from there, we're kind of taking a journey or a chronology through, the, through your space. As I mentioned Communique at the beginning, it was the darling of events and really kind of reimagined what events could do and incentive could do in this country. Talk a little bit about your experience there about founding. I mean, you grew from like yeah. nothing to 50 people in just a couple of years, yeah, right? Yeah, we, we were well over 100 uh, at our peak. I should never have been in this business. I knew nothing about running an agency. But I came up to Toronto uh, from Montreal and joined an audiovisual company. Their name was Procreation. They thought that was clever. I was selling the business. I didn't find it clever because I, I, you know, it was constantly taking us down a rabbit hole where I just wanted to sell ideas. And in those days, and you mentioned it, this is way before almost anybody in this room, probably everybody in this room, but the medium of choice before there was video projectors was slides. Now, most of you don't even know what a slide is, but it was, it's the negative that turns into a picture. You probably don't even know what a picture is because it's digital, but anyway, so we used to put these 18 projector slides together and synchronize in a way that almost be like a flip book. You could create motion. One thing would dissolve to another. The most extraordinary medium. I mean, it's the most beautiful medium to yeah. see these vistas. So when I got into this, clients would come to us and it was like they'd want a slideshow because they, they, after the slideshow was on, their president would get up and open the thing. So, these poor kids that were signed on to this project were in fear if they messed up because this was the red carpet that was gonna introduce the president. But it also kind of said the same thing. We've got a great company, great products, great people. So I came up with the idea of saying, why don't we make generic slideshows? Instead of you freaking out with your 20 grand, I'll spend 50, 60, 100,000, in those days, a lot of money. I'll get people like Christopher Plummer to narrate it. The stories about vision or customer service or the, the main themes. And the client could come in and look at it, and then when it said our company, the Pepsi logo would come up. Our products, Pepsi products, they just so salivate our, our, our people and Pepsi people. Well, a day later, I could take 60 slides and turn Pepsi to General Motors or to, to Kraft or anybody else. It was called off the shelf. Well, this thing took off. Like, it was ridiculous. Like, again, we went to about 100 people. We, got, we took that anchor and we got an event business and meeting planning and we had content business and live business. We had exclusive rights to the second state. Had a terrific run and I sold the business to a British firm for $27 million. Yeah, now let me tell you the rest of the story. So <laughs> I take 700,000 down because they, they, they're going to say, this, you want it all in shares because these 27 million, you're going to be as wealthy as the Beatles. So six months later, they went bankrupt with my $27 million of the paper, but it was a great lesson in life. So that was, my, that was my time in the event business. Still my favorite, favorite part of my career, next to probably what I'm doing now, was the ability to making events happen and making audiences' eyes shine, their heart beat, they walk with swagger, feel excited about who they're, the company they're with, and that's the magic of the business that you're in. I mean, you're in the business of creating experiences and they are far more memorable, as my lemonade stand was, to any stuff that anybody can buy. And when you create that kind of experience, you're just elevating the culture, you're elevating their competitiveness, you're elevating their sense of being and belonging and meaning. And especially nowadays, that is, you know, that is essential work. 
That's not just anymore something we, we, we're trying to afford. That is something we need to, to, to invest in. If you were going to give some... <laughs> nice feeling, right? Yeah. If you were going to give some advice to, you know, sitting in the audience and going, okay, I see what... There's an opportunity here, and we, we heard a lot about that yesterday, right? Is there, there's, there was this gap when virtual began to arise, and now there's a lot of things at play in the market in terms of, you know, staffing and cost and, and stuff like that. But there's also a higher order of conversation, it feels like, around strategy. What advice would you give to an audience like this about how to capitalize on that? We get very obsessed with channels. You know, I'm an expert at DJ, I'm a mentalist, I'm an event planner, a meeting planner, uh, I'm working in the hotel industry, I'm a supplier. And I think to elevate it, I always look at the event business like a bow tie. The center of the bow tie is the event. And you want that so beautiful. Because you ever look at a bow tie, it's the center that catches your eye. And you want to make that, you want to compress and make it magical. But what ladders into the bow tie and what ladders out is just as important. So it's, what, is, what are we doing to invite people, to set the quest, to understand why they're coming to the event? What, what, what did they do to, to achieve that event if it's an incentive travel? And then what happens at the event? And then afterwards, what do you do with the content you've created? Very often, we leave everything in the center. And we don't take advantage of the wings. So the first thing I would do is elevate the overall purpose. It's a journey. We're all on journeys in life. You, we're all on a quest. We're a quest to uh, safety, security, love and belonging. You studied Maslow. Purpose, self-actualization. Every day, every one of your clients, every one of your suppliers, every one of your employees, every one of you are a different series of quests to better yourself. That's what makes us human. The trouble with the incentive travel industry, in my opinion, in the meetings is we tend to think of it as, as an event. And it's not. It's, it's part of somebody's life's journey. And the more that you can pack that knapsack, laddering into it and coming out of it, I think that takes the, the, the conversation from, is this something we need to do? or we have to do versus something that we absolutely is imperative to the quality of culture and organization and brand that we're putting out there. And this is why I think just having that swagger, problem is very often you get caught into the, if you're, how many people are on the client side? Most of you people are servicing clients? You get, good, so I can talk about clients. Um, you get caught up often in the bowels of the organization. You know, you don't get to that C-suite, and I think what I would be doing at this industry uh, and you do it so well, Jason, is I would be elevating the narrative, talking about how important it is to invest in the person in your brand personality, to put the human back in humanity. And I think organizations that are like, uh, nowadays are so lost in what they're, w how they're connecting with their people, you've got to take it to the higher level. It's not going to be one person, but it's going, to, it's going to be a lot of whispers that turn into a roar where people really do view this as important, if not more important, than how they advertise to the consumer is how they market who they are to their people. And that's what I would be doing, really elevating the narrative and the conversation. They should hire you as an industry and get your conversation out. How many invoices are you going to send me? Several. Uh, and, and just get you, and really elevate the Elevate the dialogue so that the C-suite understands, and not just even the H HR, the entire C-suite understands that their ability to compete and be relevant and differentiate themselves is their people. And you are probably the most important element in, in having people feel that they belong. And right now, you've got the biggest opportunity I've ever seen because people don't feel they belong anymore. They're checking out, they're resigning, they're hiding behind screens, they don't want to come back to work, they've lost. I was hearing people talk uh, that work here, and they're just, you know, looking at this lake and this beautiful building, and they were just, they weren't happy. So they need people, pe they need your industry to come in there and, and, and recalibrate and rethink what culture is all about. That's the whole idea of recalibration and rethink, right down to the tactical level. Like you mentioned this idea of like, having this content, for example, and then using it afterwards. It's something that I've had a lot of experience with. You know, we, we, we do a couple of teasers, right, before to announce the event, and then we do like a post-event video. That, from a revenue perspective, just purely from a tactical perspective, there's a huge opportunity there. If you start thinking about the event as a crown jewel in a crown full of jewels, and then think, you know, C2's done such a good job with this. They have the, the aquarium, right, which is they have a, a live radio booth. They record all of that content at the event 
event, and it's people before they take the stage or after they take the stage and do those deeper dives, and then they turn it into a 52-week campaign so they can build the community around that. Like, we need to bring more of that here. The challenge has been investment, money, right? Like, is to be able to make that story work. Yes and no. I mean, I, when I sold my second agency, I had no idea what I was going to do, but I just was tired of clients. I was tired. I was burnt out. I'd done it for 32 years. And, but it was, you know, 32 years is a grind, right? And I went through three recessions, and, you, you know, you're so worried about losing your t top employees and wondering how you're going to get rid of your mediocre ones. And it was just, it's, you know, because you're human, and they're people, and they're, and they, and you, they matter to you. And then when, but when business turns, you've got to make those decisions. So I, I wanted to, I, I was done with it. And when I started uh, first as a keynote speaker, and then what I really saw was the market opportunity for me, and I think for a lot of you, is there's very few events that are attached to a core idea. Like, what's the core idea of this event? What are you walking, what are you going in? What, what itch is being created that you're saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be better for spending my time here? There's, of course, there's networking and all the benefits, but what's the core idea and how does that idea knit together across every touch point? So everything is working together to amplify it so that when somebody comes home at the end of the event, and somebody says, was that worth your time and money? Big question off nowadays. They could say, absolutely. You know, we chased the word purpose. Or we, looked, we, looked, we spent two days talking about our brand, and we looked at it as a prism from every lens. And here's what I, I, I can tell you about who we are and why we matter. When you get to that, that compression of that core idea, you're not having clients coming away saying, should I do this again? It, they're going to be coming away saying, when am I going to do this again? Because it, because you, you, something of strategic importance, some essential question, something that's a burning desire, we, we answered over that event, as opposed to going, oh yeah, we got the keynote guy, the mentalist is going to come up, fantastic DJ, you're going to coach the speakers, and oh, all the pieces are in place, but without a core idea, it's almost like going, watching a movie where you go, I don't even know where I am in this movie. And that's what I saw a lot of events. That's why it turned into more of a sort of strategic conference host as opposed to a speaker, someone that would knit things together. And I would say to you that that's where there's a real opportunity, as you said, to turn a, uh, the bow tie into 52 weeks a year, have it elevated. Uh, and I don't know when you're doing events. Like I, I, would, I would have the best people like, I mean, you know me another invoice, making sure that the CEO and the C-suite, their narrative is consistent. Right. Have you ever gone to an event where it looks like a male cat is sprayed everywhere? And, and it's just like you're going, there's a theme here, but like, what does this all have to do with each other? You know, and it's like, it just, it just, it, uh, it, there's no sense of, there's no, and that's to me where a great event is when you come in there and you go, it just, it takes you on a beginning of anticipation. It's like a hero's journey. You leave your home, you go to this event, you meet up with other people, you're overcoming challenges, you're learning, you're, and you, the desired outcome is you come back feeling so much better about who you are, the organization you work. And I think when you can get that hero's journey done, almost like a great author does an event, that's, that's when the, I mean, that's the events that I came out of going, that was magical. There, there's that great story, old story about Bill Clinton and James Carville, his chief of staff, right? Uh, Clinton had a giant whiteboard on his, uh, in, in, his, in his war room, and on the whiteboard, and, and this story is a pretty old classic story, is wrote, it's the economy, stupid. That's the one message that he wanted to get across. But for me, I'll he tell you the story in that, because that's an interesting one, because Bill Clinton is one of the smartest people on the planet. He could go on a nuclear sub and talk about how the reactors worked, and he wanted to tell everybody how smart he was. Who wouldn't? If I was that smart, I just gonna. You want to talk about nuclear subs? Let's go. And it was that's where they zeroed in and said, no, no, you're gonna talk about one thing. It's the economy, stupid. Like, and that's the other thing that was on the whiteboard. That's my favorite yeah. part of the story, which is if you say three things, yeah. you say nothing. Yeah. I love that line. Yeah. You're the first person I've ever met who knows that part of the story. It's a great story. Of course you do. Well, it's, I, it, I was a big fan of a big fan of Bill Clinton's ability to use words. Like you are, oh God, you're gonna owe me a lot. Uh, use words to to shape. You know, think about stories. And this originally, I was gonna do a keynote for you. Stop telling your story, become part of theirs. But um, we so often want to talk about what we do for a living. We just can't wait to talk about. And and I always go in this noisy world where we're drinking content from a fire hose. You put you, you put the best PowerPoint presentation together. 
chances are it's going to be spilled on the floor because you just don't have time for all this content. But if, and, and you know, when Bell and Rogers tells me who's got the fastest network, I just want to stick a fork in my eye. I couldn't care. <laughs> I don't care. You know, it's like, and yet, when it's about me and my journey in life, you know, if Bell said to me, I can get you set up, I'd spend a lot of time in Costa Rica in the winters, I can get you set up with the best fiber and theater so you can do your virtual conferences and, and I can connect you, if that f fails, to Musk's satellite system, I'm gonna lean in because it's about my life. And so when you're in the event business, as much as you want to get, you want the first 10 pages of your, I call it PowerPoint coma, putting clients into comas, but you want to spend 10 or 15 pages all the pictures and stuff that you've done, I would start off and say, I'm in the business of shining eyes and beating hearts. I'm in the business of seeing people skip at the end of a conference. I'm in the business of laughter and camaraderie and, and that wonderful sound when seven people are talking about our business around a bar or they're doing an event that they might have been scared to do and they come out of it and they've accomplished something. That's the business that we're in. And when you frame it about their story versus yours, it's unbelievable how clients will lean in and how you might even overcome procurement just wanting to chop your budget down to zero because you've elevated it to what really matters. It's, it's not so much that you put on a great disco night. It's about the fact that we're gonna have, after you know, three years of being in prison looking at screens, our company's going to dance like no one's watching. All right? That's what a disco, that's what a DJ does. So. We, and the thing is, we kind of know that. Like, we always say it's about the client, it's about the audience, and that sort of thing. But then we, when it comes to the rubber hits the road, it's, but here's what I want to say. Like, I, I did an event in San Diego in May, and I coached everybody except for the last two speakers who were doing case studies. The, first, the second guy got up, he spent five minutes talking about his Myers-Briggs score. And I'm, I'm just, I, I took him aside during rehearsal. I said, I, I want to be gentle about this, but nobody cares, right? And I watched the audience trickle out. It was astonishing. Two thirds of the audience left that room during the, those presentations. I just see it by the, you know, the smartphones. Everybody's got a magic wand now. I mean, I'm going to leave and summon a chariot. I sleep in strangers' beds now with Airbnb. You know, like it's, it's the world's changed. And yet so often people don't realize you've got to work hard for that audience. You gotta keep them engaged. Like if you, like this, this we, we are multitasking. We, you know, people say we have less attention span than a goldfish. I disagree. I think we have just an insatiable appetite for shiny objects. And so if you're not shiny on stage, if you're not relevant, if you don't matter to me, then I go, why would I pay attention? So the other thing I'd say to you if I was in the event business is be the experts at engagement. I always called it head, heart, and hands. People, clients love this. Steal us, because I'm not in the business anymore. Head, heart, and hands. What do you mean? He said, you know what? Great communication. Head, I get it immediately. Like, it should, be, it should be just compressed into a single thought. Heart, I'm excited. This is for me. I'm energized. Hands, I'm going to friggin' steal it from me and start applying it in the marketplace. Head, heart, and hands. Problem is that very often we just want to be so important with our decks and our charts and our graphs and our, you know, like I used to, coach the people in my meeting planning, they couldn't wait to show the four-page agenda, minute by minute, and what was happening. This is fantastic. You're showing yourself how organized you are, that you, are, you run this like a military operation. That's all you need to say. You don't need to show the 20 pages. What you need to do is look them in the eye with absolute confidence and say, I'm in, there's going to be mistakes happening, but because of my level of preparation, we're going to mitigate them. There'll be internal failures. The audience will never see them. Right? If a plane suddenly doesn't arrive when it's supposed to, I have a backup plan. I want to hire that person. Versus, like, look at my, my 30 pages I've organized each. Now, you're very proud of what you've done, and you, there's no question you want to share it, but I would share it with family and friends, not so much the client. It's, it's interesting. Um, I find that those conversations were always difficult to have. Like, you, you, you're meeting with a middle manager, and they brush you off. They're like, yeah, yeah, show me my stage. But right now, there's an extraordinary opportunity when you just say the following statement. I want to talk to the C-suite because audiences have changed. Now, they, they have and they haven't, but 
they, the, the client is actually buying into that idea. And then once you do that, then you can go in and say, I use a, a, a concept called MIRV, M-I-R-V. Meaningful, interesting, relevant, valuable. If it's not those things, your audience is going to tune out entirely. So here's how you keep them. And they, that's something for, for groups who didn't want to talk about speaker coaching or groups who didn't want to look at expanding their event, they're buying into that, which is really fascinating to me. Yes, and I'm not disagreeing with you, but that's a little bit of talking about yourself. And I would elevate it, and I don't mean it wrong, because it's, it's, I mean, it's a great pillars, but where you started off as audiences is changing. I think that that is the biggest problem facing organizations nowadays is their culture. And there's a lot going on. There's a lot of boomers that are retiring. That nobody's, everybody's blaming the pandemic. But there's a lot of very experienced, dedicated, committed people leaving the workforce. I think a million and a half have left in the last couple of years, and another million's gone. That's creating a vacuum. The second thing is you've got a whole new generation coming in with very different expectations of work-life balance. Uh, like, you know, when the boomer got home after work, they kind of, there wasn't a lot of options. There was, you know, three. TV channels, you had to, f I remember running home from high school fighting with my sisters. If I got there first, I got to watch Hogan's Heroes because we had one TV. If I didn't, they watched Petticoat Junction, one of the lamest TV shows ever. <laughs> but we didn't have a lot of choice, we didn't have a lot. So this new generation's coming in has. And the other thing is this new generation are gamifiers. They're used to gaming the system. They don't want things linear. They, you know, these agendas that, that they, they, that, you know, it's, it's almost that they're going to start suffocating when they see, well, you've put out this very impressive agenda, nine to five, breaks and everything else. That's not their life. Their life is an agenda. It's multitasking, it's flow, it's like liquid that travels everywhere. So this is what organizations are struggling with. The, I think the event people that can, you say audiences are changing, what I'm just thinking is the dynamics have changed. The ones that can get to that level of conversation you know, take advantage of Jason's magazine and start putting editorial out talking about uh, culture, talking about um, engagement with the, is there differences between generations? I, for one, would be controversial. I don't think it has anything to do with demographics. I mean, I just talked about the boomer, but that was more of a work ethic thing. I think that when you say males 18 to 49 and clump them as a segment, I don't know two 18-year-old males that are the same, let alone an 18 and a 49-year-old. But if I happen to like hiking at my age, and I meet a 20-year-old that likes hiking, we have a lot in common. Those are our values. So starting to understand the values, the notes of the organization, almost the psychology of the business, I think is going to really elevate your ability to get to that C-suite and have meaningful conversation. And then what you have, which I like, is the process. Because the other thing I'll say to you about my experiences with clients is they, buy, they love people but buy process. What I mean by that is they come in and they go, I really like you, man. Like this, we do. So, you know, and you're talking, yeah, I get it. So, how are you going to do it? Well, if you're still the same, yeah, well, you know, we just figure shit out and things that happen and we do this and we do that, versus, no, I want to talk to you about MERV. MERV is a process that's going to get you to where we want to be. Then that works really well. Yeah. Higher narrative, higher elevated conversation about what matters to them, and then figure out the how you do it. Problem again is very often we jump into the how. You know, we, we really want to talk about all the stuff and, and I don't think, the last thing I say, and I'm getting a little, I don't want to be repetitive, but I'll say, I don't want to lose this thought. Most of you fail because of shitty briefs from clients and you accept shitty briefs because you're just so happy to have the business. But I think if you were to take the client and really elevate what they're after, is this event to inspire people, motivate, educate, celebrate? Talk to me about your culture. Is it coming back? Are you working? How many people are coming back to the office? When was the last time they, they got together? How about if people are still risk adverse of being in a group? Like, if you, if you get the brief at a much higher level, I think when you come back and talk about your ideas, they're going to be more meaningful and therefore have more value. And therefore, you're probably going to be able to price it a little bit better. So you've had experience with that, right? About having those higher value conversations. You started at Communique, then you founded Capital C. Just this is the second part of my journey with yeah. you that you don't know about. Well, we got another one. Yeah, well, it's just- You owe me twice. That's right. My, um, my very first freelance job, I was actually in my last week before graduation at Ryerson, is Tony's agency, Capital C, 
they uh, had the CN Tower as the accountant. The CN Tower was about to open the glass floor. And so they said, we need somebody to write the panels that tell the history of, of the CN Tower. So you sent me, your creative director sent me to the boiler room. Uh, I was wearing a wool suit. It was the middle of June. Oh boy, that was a day. And, and to, to pull slides. And so that was my very, so there's the second place that I owed you. But your, your time at Capital C was, if, if, if Communicate was about internal, this is about external. How did you have those higher order conversations with companies like Pepsi and the CN Tower? It's a, you know, great question. We, we always believed we could do anything. We convinced the NHL that we could build a Hockey Hall of Fame. I, didn't, I don't even know what drywall looks like. But, we, but we got, what we got at the time was the, the, the top people in the NHL playing interactive video games in our boardroom that really didn't exist yet. And so they bought into the whole dream. So th th what I learned from the event side was to create theater of the mind, even when doing communications. Craft Hockeyville was one of ours, bride cutting off her hair just before she got married, wigging out. And it was always about the theater, the journey. I'll give you a great example. So talking about the wig out. So Sun uh, Unilever was a big client of ours. Came to us and said, we want to launch another shampoo in Canada called Sun Silk. It's very popular in South Asia and stuff. I said, a, a shampoo in Canada? I said, there's 400 shampoos already here. And then and in the old days, it used to be a value shampoo, a premium shampoo, and then dandruff came out. And that was, oh, cool, I can get a shampoo. You know, remember the dandruff head and shoulders? And next thing you know, they're smelling like Irish Spring, and there's blonde and platinum and curly and air, the whole categories. And so I said, well, Sun Silk is really popular. I said, that's perfect. We'll just go and say, this is the most popular shampoo in, in South Asia, so you're going to buy it in Canada. I, what we found out, insights, so powerful, is that women hate bad hair days. Now, nowadays, you probably can't say this because you're supposed to be all co-gender and stuff, but the, the insights, the research said, and I knew that they had this insight because every time we tested it, they always had a story. Oh, I hate bad hair days. I ran into my old boyfriend. Oh, that's nothing. I ran into my old boyfriend's new girlfriend. Or I went, but there's always a story. So we said, launch a new shampoo. What if we could be the shampoo that ends bad hair days? So we tested for $3,000 a bride, four brides in a bridal party, coming back. She hates her hair right before she gets married. What's the worst time to have bad hair days, your wedding day? She cuts off her hair. $3,000. Put it out on YouTube, whatever that was. This was like the first year of YouTube. Two days, three days later, Ryan Seacrest talks about this bride wigging out and plays some of our video. People think this thing's real. Oprah, Jay Leno, uh, Entertainment Tonight. I mean, 10,000 media outlets around the world. Norm Jewison, our famous director, weighs in and says, no, that's real, that's not fake. And I look at it and go, it was just so cheesy. It was $3,000. Test, we're just testing the insight. Where am I going with this story? So what I talk about is insights, is what, where I took theater of the mind and understanding consumers, how they think, feel, and behave, head, heart, and hands, combining those two is what made our agency, uh, we, had just, we had an unbelievable run. I mean, we, we went for 22 years. I think there was three months we lost money. We had some of the most memorable campaigns. We fought way above our weight class. And it was wonderful. And what changed, and I hope it doesn't happen to your industry, is marketers went from spending money, because they had a budget to spend, and they love big ideas, and they'd always have something for a big idea, to investing. Overnight, they changed the whole psychology of the business, because suddenly, is that idea going to work? How much is it going to cost? You were the client two weeks ago. Give me a big idea. Let's, let's experiment. So that changed, and that's one of the reasons I eventually got out of the business, because I just got worn down by thinking big and executing small. Right. It's interesting though, like you use a phrase like insights, which is common to the advertising world, uncommon to kind of our world, but that's where that higher order conversation comes from. And I know you wanted to talk a little bit about costs. We see 
ballooning costs right now. We talked about it a bit yesterday, right? Staging every part, the fact that you can't get teams and staff, but we have to have those conversations with our clients about how that's changing. By and large, the, the more courageous of, of the bunch are being able to frame that as an investment kind of conversation. How would you recommend to this audience to be able to have those kind of conversations around cost? I think if you're in control of your core idea and your narrative, it's gonna first of all allow you to decide where do I prioritize the theater and maybe where do I do less theater? Like as opposed to just taking one budget and stretching it so thin that there's, there's holes through it. So the core idea and the narrative is very important. In my experience in clients, there's three kinds of buyers. There's a strategic buyer that wants to know where is my company heading and how can you help me get there. There's technical buyers that say, are, is this going to work? Are you capable? Am I going to be embarrassed or not? And then there's economic buyers procurement. Very often, we get a lot of excitement initially in our proposals and then the economic buyers come back and you're, right. next thing, you know, yeah. you're shaving, cutting, and everything just becomes a cost mess. I think the only way out of this for you is, first of all, strategically get people to realize this is of utmost importance to their organization, not just something they have to do, something they need to do. More than ever, they have to bring this band of brothers and sisters together as one. And the second thing is really uh, maybe take away your expectations of what I used, I used to do all of this stuff now, and I'm going to do it in a very different way. I went, when I was in communicating capital, see, I went through a couple of bad recessions, and clients just didn't have the money they had. Um, and you've just got to find a way to still make that noise and impact where it matters, and less so where you just love the, the frills. Does that make sense? But if you don't have that core idea, if you're not chasing that really powerful journey with this group together, it's impossible to do because everybody's fighting. Somebody wants flower arrangements on the table. Somebody wants, you know, a uh, big stage and screen. People want parties at night and stuff. But if you've got the core idea, at least you can say to the client, we can prioritize around that and still make an impact. We're just not going to be able to, you know, it's, it's just not going to be a Broadway play for an over, Broadway musical over two or three days. Now, you spend a lot of time these days on stages like this as a keynote, having these conversations, even on screens over the course of the pandemic. What are you noticing? Like, what are you seeing that you can help everyone be aware of? Uh, I'm seeing a lot of fear in the eyes of CEOs and C-suite that they really don't know what's next. And they're, they're not sure how things are going to unfold. Um, and I'm seeing us immediately ratchet into this recession mentality. So we're going to talk our way into this recession. We're going to, uh, uh, you know, create interest rates are going to push us. But mentally, we're starting, I'm seeing people go from positive to negative very quickly and uh, reactive versus proactive. And which is natural because when you're not sure where you're going, when you have uncertainty and insecurity, it's tough to feel that sense of confidence. Am I going to invest in it? This is, again, where I think you need to elevate the narrative of your industry is that the, the people that are going to compete and win in this marketplace are the ones that have confidence, conviction, they're passionate, there is a higher purpose. I don't know what clients you work with, but the, thing, the other thing I would be fascinated with if I was getting in your business today is that so many organizations now are elevating a higher purpose than just profit. They made a stance in the environment, or you know, Sun Life's about diabetes, or you know, RBC's about climate change. Is there anything you can be doing as you go into these organizations to connect their, the event to their purpose? For example, if RBC is very much in wanting to make a stance on the environment with their Tech for Nature program, is there something that you can be doing as an event that connects the two? You know, if, if, it's, if, uh, if Sun Life is t is, wants to make a major case that why it makes them different is that they're very committed to diabetes and healthcare, is there an event where the salespeople can go and watch, see an operating room? You know, go in, go in the theater and watch it and understand why we're investing in healthcare. And I think that would be an interesting play. I'm not sure enough, enough people are doing because it tends to be the philanthropic side of the organization versus the C-suite. But if you can bring the two of them together, that's an interesting tiebreaker. All right. I, I love that phrase, tiebreaker. That, that I caught that this morning. It really meant a lot, the idea of what's your differentiator. We have, you know, you talked about big ideas. 
And in this country, there are three particularly standout global events, TED, C2 Montreal, and The Gathering in, in Alberta, that are kind of rallied around a central concept, a different way to do things. They're kind of like our... Wow. Always something new, eh? Well, when you say three big events all in one sentence, you got to expect that. <laughs> I hope our photographer caught that one, that moment on I think you have to mention this event. Jason that, that's it, I didn't mention this event, right? So if you had put that in, you wouldn't have had... And that. I wasn't talking about just events for events, but we, we see those are original stories. What are you seeing out there that, you know, when you talk about big ideas, what's, what's impressing you? What do you think's neat? What even is the wrong direction? Well, I love... Have you ever been to a live TED event? I actually went to one, the original ones in Oxford, and it blew my mind that people are only allowed 15 minutes. I mean, that's Obama or Oprah or anybody. You're allowed 15 minutes. And I love the fact that um, people got to the essence of what they're talking about. C2 Montreal is very different. It's changing a lot now that Sid Lee sold their business to Q, but it's just an intellectual orgasm. I'm not sure it's... I think you walk away like Davos thinking you're very smart, you intended it, and I think you're going to get like this master class of really smart people, but I would, I think you go there just for intellectual stimulation on it. The gathering is brilliant because they found a way to bring all these CMOs all over the world right. to do it. I think the idea of doing, I'm, I'm working with the Wall Street uh, on an upcoming event and I'm working with Economic Club in an upcoming event and I'm saying to them, you got to start creating recurring events. You got to own, you got to put your, you got to go after something and every year build on it it's good for me because I want the repeat business as the host too, but, but I'm elevating the conversation to them saying this is where you've got to, you, you know, you, you can talk economic club and bring four economists together and have a sold out house, but the economy, there's no such thing as business needs, only human needs. There's no, there's no business needs, it's human need. You sell to humans, you, your business runs by humans, and you got to, this talent thing is something that is, I think is going to be the biggest uh, thing to, for organizations to, to wrestle. And if any of you in there are, want to really elevate and be an expert on how to knit cultures together and, and do events and measure how people are going in and how they are coming out and give people metrics, I would, that would be a very rich area for, for to focus on. Fantastic. Now, we, we've kind of traced your career a little bit. Lately, you've been doing Chatter That Matters on radio, it's on podcasts. It's another great Canadian success story. What are you learning? Oh, so much. I, this started at the beginning of the pandemic, which I thought at the time was going to be three weeks. Remember, we were going to shut down for three weeks. But I, I figured my career as speaking and hosting was over. I mean, nobody even thought about virtual. I said, well, what am I going to do? Maybe I'll just retire. And, but I know that would drive my wife crazy. So um, I, I had this little idea of a podcast and I went to RBC saying, can we do a series, like if small businesses are the heart of our economy, it's our collective interest to keep them beating strong, can I do a series where I'll interview a owner of a small business and then have three of my experts that I've met through my career, like really, Joe Mimran and Arlene Dickinson, and, Terry Riley weigh in and offer advice to a small business owner that would never get advice from these people because they had time because of the pandemic. So we did that, and I, I was so touched by these small business heroes and what they were doing. This is early on. That led to RBC saying we really love the fact that, and the, the, the core idea of this is that I sold this as my elevator pitch is half a floor in this relentless storm of negativity and this growing sense of impossibility, I want to share stories about possibility. I want to tell stories about people that are making things happen despite today's circumstances, and in doing so, their life lessons can inspire all of us to do more and be more. RBC said, I love it. So now we've just turned it on steroids, and I'm talking to some of the most interesting people in the world. And I feel my entire career has led me to have this uh, this unbelievable labor of love to people with such, I mean, these are people that are from Andre de Grasse and Arlene Dickinson and Susan Cain are real quiet, 40 million people to rather watch your TED talk to people that are refugees like Tarak Hadid who came into this country and now, and four years later is giving back. 
And these stories, are, there's one you need to listen to. Sh Chatter that matters, Joe Pine. The godfather of the experience economy, he wrote the experience economy. He's a teacher, he's an educator, and he's, this podcast, you could turn into turning your business into steroids. And his entire new business is all about, is that time well spent? You know, if I go to Disney versus the movies versus your event, how do I value my time? And is time well spent? That would be an incredible one for you to listen to in, in terms of uh, uh, really getting an appreciation of, of where, what he believes experience is, education, entertainment. And I think you could actually take his model and put it into a lot of your presentations. Awesome. Now, we, we covered a lot today. We talked about the importance of, of having the big idea, really centralizing and connecting to purpose, you know, how we can have those higher-minded conversations. So as we finish here today, is there any other advice you'd like to share with our audience? You know, I'll just leave you with, as tough as it is, first of all, the pandemic must have been just horrific on your, your group. And... A lot, some of you guys scrambled and reinvented, and I'm, I'm just so impressed, but it was tough. It was tough on everybody that lived for creating shining eyes and beating hearts. It was shit, and it went on way too long. And, but never lose sight, honestly, of what you do. As tough as it is, the grind, price points, stupid clients, uh, whatever. I don't mean all clients are stupid. I've had great clients. But you know, stupid questions or people that are just panicking when you're trying to make something mission critical happen and somebody's upset because there's no date squares at the bar or whatever. Uh, just realize that you are in one of the most important, especially now, the most important professions because you're, you're putting the human back into humanity, even if it's just for a couple of days, even if for an event, even if it's just the beginning of a teaser video, and never lose sight of that calling and that purpose. And stay, keep passionate about it, keep pursuing it, keep trying to make it better, as opposed to letting it wear you down. Because I think when you look back in your career, like I look back in mine, other than this podcast, being in the event business, Whereas I got the greatest sense of satisfaction seeing our team of people putting on these, you know, in a, in a ballroom that didn't, it, they just had carpet on the floor and chandeliers. And two days later, we're staging this magnificent event that people are just having a phenomenal time at. That's, that's, a, that's an incredible place to, to make a living. So keep doing it. And thank you. Tony Chapman, thank you for the career, but more importantly, thank you for the advice that you've given today. This was an outstanding conversation. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Over to our friend Sam. Let's hear from you, That was amazing.